going back to aging clocks, actually. So th there are many different aging clocks. Do you have do you have one that you think is the most kind of relevant and reliable? Yeah, and that's a really good question. So I think the one that most people have probably heard of, which we've already spoken about, is the epigenetic aging clocks. And I think that's um, the one. There's a lot of data sets now that have been produced using this this method. Um, and there's been lots of advancements in doing it in different tissues and different organisms. Um, and even more recently, um, there's even more interest now in trying to address this mechanistic underpinning and trying to identify what these different methyl marks and DNA might be meaning in, in the context of aging. Morgan Levine, who I, can't, I don't know if you, you might have spoken to her before on this channel, but um, she recently uh, published a preprint where they've like deconstructed the epigenetic aging clocks and found like functional modules of certain subsets of marks. Um, I haven't fully read the paper yet. And I think there's more to the story that will come out when she fully publishes the paper. But I think if we can understand more about the mechanism to epigenetic clocks, I'll be more convinced that it's a good way to measure aging. So on the flip side, the other kind of aging measurements that I think are somewhat maybe more valuable at the moment, but they're more expensive and kind of, I guess, harder to do are like transcriptomic aging clocks. So this is when you uh, take the RNA from a cell, basically look at what genes are being expressed in different cell types. And the beauty of doing that is genes um, are well, are much better characterized. Um, and so if you can see what genes are being expressed, their abundances and how they vary, it also enables you to go um, ask questions about what's going on within that cell. Is it producing lots of inflammatory signaling molecules or complement cascades or anti-inflammatory molecules? Or um, is it upregulating mitochondrial genes or autophagy? And so when you get that information as well, you can ask more interesting questions. So I think that's um, also a kind of aging clock that's interesting to follow. And another one I think is quite cool, which I've only seen like one, that's one main paper that always comes to mind is the gut microbiome. There was a study that looked at how that changes with age. And yeah, I can't quite remember the details, but you can use the abundance and presence of different bacterial species to also predict age. Um, and that's interesting because uh, the microbiome produces all these different secretory components as well that seem to signal with our cells, especially our, our brain. Um, it produces things like um, serotonin and other neurotransmitters. Um, so I think the microbiome is fascinating. Um, and also it's something that can be modulated by diet. But I think that biology is a bit of an enigma at the moment, but like really fascinating. So that's also something I'm trying to follow at the same time. Who is working on the transcriptomic? Is there someone developing a clock based on that? Um, so there has been some clocks already produced. Um, there's, I, I can't pronounce this, something Schumacher, he's based in Germany, I believe, is working on um, a transcriptomic clock. And then there was also Alex Z, I can't pronounce his surname either, <laughs> who uh, a while ago also had a transcriptomic aging clock. But definitely there's work being done on it. And also um, I spoke this week to uh, Shift Bioscience. And so they're also using uh, transcriptomic data to try and uh, create an aging clock that they can then use to identify uh, reprogramming factors. You would think that, I mean, there's other clocks as well. I mean, there's like inflammation clocks and there's, you mentioned like uh, protein, protein changes in like C. elegans. So could you build a clock on P53, like a different, <laughs> <laughs> different um, expression? That's an interesting question. Um, so the thing with P53 that, so from, um, yeah, so P53 is a, basically it's a transcription factor for those who don't know, um, that gets activated in response to kind of like stressful situations, a common one uh, being DNA damage. And then uh, P53 can activate a variety of downstream responses, um, such as cell death. Um, it can change the metabolism. It can also try to promote uh, repair of damage, or it can promote uh, cellular senescence. P53 is also uh, the most commonly mutated gene seen in human cancers. So there's something about this gene that, I don't know, it seems to either be A, more prone to getting mutated, or B, on from that, 
if it gets mutated, that mutation is more likely to be selected for because it's ad- advantageous to that cell. And so in the lab, I actually study mutants B53. Um, so um, try it's basically, there are different attributes to the mutants P53. So often when people think about DNA mutations, they think it kind of like prevents that protein being expressed and you completely lose function of that protein. But the interesting thing with mutant P53 is it seems to have these uh, gain of function effects. So the protein still gets produced. Yeah, so uh, I should also rewind a little bit and say that P53 is a transcription factor and so it binds DNA and it activates uh, the expression of other genes. And so when you mutate this protein, um, it can no longer interact strongly with DNA. And so you, it loses its ability to uh, express these different genes. Um, but it also seems to have these gain of function activities where it does novel uh, features that it doesn't normally do. So to go back to your question about having a P53 clock, <laughs> one could say you could because like um, you can use like P16 and P21 reporter mice to see like the accumulation of uh, senescent cells of age. But P53, like, I mean, the same of P16 and P21, uh, there's many different markers of senescent cells and one marker alone may not be sufficient. So I don't think there'd be enough information from just looking at P53 to be able to to build a clock. Um, It's probably my answer at the moment. But there's also this very limited data looking at how P53 expression changes uh, throughout age. Speaking with P53 for the moment, so why did you pick P53 and cellular senescence as your PhD topic? Pick is an interesting word. Um, I picked the lab and it was kind of like, this is the project ah, I want you okay. to do. <laughs> right. But I mean, I did agree to the project. So um, yeah, I mean, so I chose the lab that studies cellular senescence and kind of similar to my interest in aging biology, I was just drawn to cellular senescence because it seems to have both these like good and I guess bad associations with aging and it just felt like a really complex problem and for some reason I'm attracted to complex problems so you have senescence on one hand and then you have p53 that's this protein that's been studied for decades now um and as I said already it's um the most commonly mutated gene seen in human cancers and so there's already been hundreds of studies trying to understand this protein, yet there's still so much we don't understand. <laughs> and so I've like combined two very complicated unknown uh, areas and kind of merged it into one. But it's definitely an interesting project. <laughs> yes. And, and congratulations on your paper, your first paper, by the way, getting that oh, thank published. You. Yeah, that was a review article talking about mm-hmm. the involvement of yeah, P53 and senescence.